I'm always on the lookout for something interesting to share or talk about. Obscurities, curiosities, and hidden gems that have fallen through the cracks. Unfortunately, a lot of these tidbits are just that. Tidbits. Minor things of interest that usually wouldn't make for a good full video. That's why I'd like to try out this format. A grab bag where I share several of these findings. If you like this format, please let me know in the comments. This video is themed around everyone's favorite teddy bear, Winnie the Pooh. Join me as we look at some rarely seen pieces of animation and a pair of forgotten characters who briefly join the main cast. Disney has been doing educational pieces since its inception, dating all the way back to dental hygiene films in 1926. In the 1980s in particular, they put out a number of educational shorts for public schools, usually aimed at grade schoolers. For the most part, they seem more like advertisements than teaching tools. Figment the Dragon could teach them about thinking creatively, and also put one little spark in their heads to go to Epcot and see him in person. The forgotten short I want to highlight is Winnie the Pooh Discovers the Seasons from 1981. What interests me about this one more than the others is how similar it is to a much better known cartoon. This was directed by Rick Reinert, who would do A Day for Eeyore two years later. Reinert previously did another educational cartoon for Disney, this one starring the cult favorite Orange Bird mascot. Based on this cartoon, I can see why Disney wanted him to direct Eeyore. Winnie the Pooh Discovers the Seasons is a surprisingly nice looking piece of animation. Content wise, it's a very basic 10 minute short explaining spring, summer, fall, and winter. Chris Robin gives Pooh a calendar at the beginning, and we see short vignettes of him and the others enjoying the changing seasons. Owl and Rabbit generally act as the teachers. The character animation is especially nice and expressive in a few moments. For a short that was meant to be a bit of educational fluff, the crew did a very good job. There are several notable shots of well-drawn birds and squirrels that we don't normally see in other Pooh media. The characters also get new, warmer wardrobes for the autumn and winter scenes. One scene where Eeyore lazily floats on his back down the river would be echoed in A Day for Eeyore under less happy circumstances thanks to Tigger. Tigger does not appear in the short, nor do Kanga, Roo, or Gopher. Rabbit seems like he's in a much better mood throughout the whole thing. Some of this is because he gets to play the educator role, but I'm sure the lack of Tigger has also put him at ease. The short was the first time Hal Smith voiced Winnie the Pooh. While the performances by Sterling Holloway and Jim Cummings are better remembered, I'm fond of Smith's take. It's a very gentle, almost grandfatherly voice. Smith would also voice Pooh in A Day for Eeyore and the Welcome to Pooh Corner TV series. Eeyore, could you stop turning around for a moment? Because it muddles me rather. As far as the entertainment factor goes, Winnie the Pooh Discovers the Seasons is aimed at the youngest of the young, even more so than the other Pooh shorts. Still, at only 10 minutes, it's a pleasant little curiosity, especially if you're a fan of this early era of Disney's Pooh. Speaking of seasons, that's something I like about the original three shorts, Honey Tree, Blustery Day, and Tigger 2. I doubt this was planned from the start, since they were all made several years apart from each other, but I like how they also cycle through the seasons. Honey Tree and Blustery Day have a spring-summer vibe, while Tigger 2 has autumn and winter. This added a nice subtle through line when they were compiled into the Many Adventures feature, since the stories are otherwise unrelated. Our next subject is a rejected pilot. There are probably hundreds upon hundreds of pilots that don't get picked up sitting in a vault somewhere, so it's always a treat when we actually get to see one. This show was developed by Cartoon Saloon, probably best known for features like The Secret of Kells and The Breadwinner. It's hard to judge a pilot since it's meant to be the jumping off point, and the show usually develops more as it goes along. With that in mind, there are things I liked about this and things I felt didn't work. The show would have been set in the Hundred Acre Wood Estates, a gated community where Chris Robin lives. The pilot has Pooh finding a cell phone. Being a bear of very little brain, Pooh assumes that this new friend is lost and tries to help it reunite with its mother. Piglet and Tigger help along with a cameo by Eeyore. After a lot of running around, they meet Christopher Robin, who holds the phone's mother, a tablet. Christopher's own mother arrives a moment later and looks at the photos her son took of his stuffed animals. There's a lot to unpack here, even though the pilot only runs at about six minutes. I was surprised at first to hear Pooh and the others speaking with British accents. Then I had to mentally kick myself because Pooh is a British story, so really it should feel strange that they've never had British accents before this. Well, except for Owl and Christopher Robin most of the time. It took a little getting used to, but the new voices and accents grew on me pretty quickly. Well, hello, new friend. <gasps> hey, good-looking fella. Doesn't say much, does he? 
What I couldn't ease into as much was the modern setting. A pleasant backyard is no match for the beautiful woods, but after setting so many stories there, I can understand why the crew might have wanted to try something different. I didn't care for Pooh interacting with a cell phone. At the risk of sounding like a grumpy old man, I'd rather keep some timelessness in the series. Watching Pooh and Christopher Robin wandering around outside looking at screens made me feel kind of depressed. Now, I will admit that the new Adventures of Winnie the Pooh series in the 80s had a few similar ideas. We saw Pooh and friends in modern places like supermarkets and movie theaters, but for a good part of the show, it was business as usual in the forest. Now, I will concede that Pooh, whether I like him having a phone or not, felt mostly in character, as did Piglet and Tigger. The only time I had to raise an eyebrow was when Pooh shouts, Woohoo! in one scene. It doesn't really sound like something he'd say. The gentle slapstick was fun, although a Looney Tunes style gag where the slow internet connection makes the phone fall slower felt out of place. It might be for the best that this show wasn't picked up, but given all the other great things that Cartoon Saloon has created, I don't think it's too big a loss on their part. For most of the Pooh franchise, Disney has largely stuck to the characters from the books, with a few exceptions. Gopher is most famously not in the books. Then there are characters who only appeared in one TV series, like the Pack Rats, or Cassie the Bird, who appeared in a couple of different shows. Lumpy was a semi-major character for a few years, but being a Heffalump, he still has a basis in the original stories. In the late 70s, Disney tried adding two other new characters to the mix. One was from a different work by A.A. A. Milne, the other was mostly original, Sir Brian and the Dragon. Bad Sir Brian Botany was a poem in the collection When We Are Very Young. It tells the story of a knight who goes around bullying people. One day, his victims are able to turn the tables, humbling Bad Sir Brian. By the next day, he's completely changed his image. Meanwhile, the collection Now We Are Six has a few references to fighting dragons. One illustration shows Christopher Robin bravely chasing one. Another depicts Christopher and Pooh pretending a flock of wild turkeys are dragons. Some would argue that turkeys are scarier. We don't really think of Pooh as being a comic character, but there were a number of Pooh comics in the 70s and 80s. There was a newspaper strip and a comic book series that ran for 33 issues. In both versions, everyone acts oddly out of character, but in different ways. In the newspaper strip, Pooh and friends tend to be a little more snippy. It fits the four-panel, gag-a-day formula, but it's pretty weird to see them speaking so callously to each other. It often makes the basic jokes seem a little funnier than they actually are because of how wrong it feels to hear Pooh delivering a scathing punchline. The comic books, meanwhile, are a bit more in line with the series, but not 100%. It's a strange slanted universe that's similar to the one we know, but different enough to throw us off. The characters still don't act quite like themselves. Pooh is sometimes a little more eloquent, and Piglet comes off as being something of a brat. Both comics featured Sir Brian and the Dragon. They first appeared in the comic strip in 1978, and made their final appearance ten years later. Actually, a quick note as I am editing this, I have some model sheets of the characters labeled 1971. They were on the drawing board for a while. I'm really not sure how deep this rabbit hole goes. Sir Brian is... well, what is he exactly? Ostensibly, he's a knight, but he's a little man the size of a stuffed animal. I like to imagine that he's some sort of dwarf or gnome. The blustery little knight prides himself on being a great hero, although he's often not very helpful when something actually goes wrong. His real passion is for battling dragons. Unfortunately for Sir Brian, and the dragon himself, the only dragon in the woods is completely harmless. Well, not completely. He's clumsy, and has a tendency to knock things over. This does not deter Sir Brian, who relentlessly chases him anyway. The result is an already accent-prone dragon knocking over even more things and animals in an attempt to escape. While Pooh and his friends like Sir Brian and the dragon enough, they find these chases to be exasperating. On a side note, I'd imagine Tigger would be all about this chaos. This ties into how no one acts entirely like themselves in the comics. Then again, Tigger likes to bounce people, but we don't ever see how he feels about being on the receiving end. Maybe he can dish it, but can't take it. Often, one of the animals will try to help the poor reluctant dragon escape the night. Sir Brian is annoyed when someone gets in the way of his chase, but he never takes out his anger on the helpers. I think he might secretly like it when someone butts in, since it adds to the challenge. Sometimes the stories will end with Sir Brian making peace with the dragon, but he's usually back to his old ways in the next appearance. They fit in nicely with the others in this regard, since the Hundred Acre Wood characters often make the same mistakes repeatedly. Who will always be a glutton no matter how many times it's got him into trouble? Tigger will always be bouncing on people no matter how often he's told to stop, 
Piglet will always be Tibbet no matter how many times he's learned to be brave, and Sir Brian will always want to hunt the dragon. Despite being at odds with each other, Sir Brian and the dragon are shown to live together, at least in some stories. As is often the case, the comics weren't too big on continuity. At the very least, Sir Brian was always depicted as living in a castle somewhere in the woods. Instead of a family crest, he's hung a yield sign over the entrance, which feels authentically poop. The only other place I could find these characters is an out-of-print children's book from 1980. They never appeared in anything animated. What's very strange is that their last appearance in 1988 was the same year that the new Adventures of Winnie the Pooh cartoon premiered. It always felt like these two were meant for more than just comics, and I feel they would have fit in nicely on the show. The series had plenty of out-there episodes, like the Western Adventure or the one where Pooh fixes a broken cloud factory in the sky. Would a little elfin knight and a timid dragon really have been that out of place? Given all the Pooh material Disney continues to create, I would be happy to see the return of Sir Brian and the Dragon. A recent discovery has come from an eBay auction. This artwork was apparently found in the storage unit of someone who worked for Disney, but no other information is available. We have what appears to be concept art for an entire Winnie the Pooh land called Pooh Corner. It would have been placed next to It's a Small World on the other side of Toontown. There are plenty of tree houses to visit and bridges that are perfect for playing poo sticks. In the center is a play area with striped trees called Tigger's Bounce Contest. I imagine Rabbit's Root Cellar would have been a restaurant. Pooh's house is near the top, and behind it appears to be some sort of boat ride involving honeypots, upside-down umbrellas, heflumps, and woozles. I wouldn't be surprised if Pooh's house served as the entrance. As you may know, Pooh eventually did come to Disneyland, replacing the Country Bear Jamboree as a smaller scale dark ride. This concept art probably predates that, but I'm really curious about just when it was created. The idea of an entire land based around one IP feels somewhat new, but it might be older than we realized. I think the closest thing we got to this idea was Pooh's Playful Spot, a small play area that used to be in Disney World. As we near the end, the final topic I want to discuss is not about Disney per se, but about the future in general. Winnie the Pooh is now a public domain character, meaning anyone can do anything with the silly old bear. One of the first things we got was the horror movie Blood and Honey. I saw a lot of people very upset at this concept, which I understand. I have not seen it myself, and even as a horror fan, I'm just not terribly interested. The thing is, I saw a few people saying they wished Pooh wasn't in the public domain, so movies like Blood and Honey wouldn't exist. I don't think that's the right way to look at the situation. Will we get more media created purely for shock value? Undoubtedly. But we will also get a lot more potentially great Pooh stories created by people who love and understand the source material. I'm ready to take the good with the bad. Disney has given us some wonderful Pooh movies and series, and I don't think they're going to stop using him. But I'm looking forward to seeing some fresh new Pooh portrayals from outside sources. Here's to the endless possibilities that await Winnie the Pooh and Piglet 2. Hello, Piglet. Hello, Pooh. How are you? I am having the strangest day. Me too. 